Hello and welcome to the Somerville Media Center Live for April 16th, 2020. I am Joe Lynch for the Somerville Media Center. Welcome to the second in a series of state delegation updates. This morning we are joined by State Senator Pat Jalen and State Representative Mike Conley. Good morning to you both. Pat, how are you feeling? So far, so good. Terrific. Mike, how about yourself? Oh, uh, doing well, Joe. Thank you for having us. Absolutely terrific. We have some sobering numbers that have come out um, over the over the night. We have now surpassed 1,100 deaths in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, the numbers will continue to climb. We have some staggering numbers on unemployment. Senator Jalen is going to be talking about that this morning. Um, Rep. Conley, you're going to be talking about some housing updates. So let's start with Senator Jalen, Pat. Sad numbers on the deaths, but even sadder for those who are facing uh, financial ruin. And some unemployment numbers are indicating that there are a lot of people out of work in the Commonwealth, a lot of people in the district that are out of work. Do you want to take it away from there? Well, it's about a half a million people in Massachusetts now. The numbers of people for applying for unemployment are more than 20 times every week than they were before this pandemic. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, there's a lot of people out of work and they were hoping for their stimulus checks. Most people who pay taxes started getting them last Friday. So that's a quarter of a million people who got $1,200 in the bank, less if they had made a lot of money. Um, but the unemployment office is struggling to keep up. They have hired, they started with 50 um, people answering phone calls. They have 600 people answering phone calls now. Um, and it's still hard for people to get through. So I have a couple of pieces of advice for people. Uh, one is if you are expecting a phone call back, you will get a call from an unidentified number because these people are making calls from their personal phone call, uh, phones. So pick up the phone, even if it's an un unidentified number, if you're hoping for a phone call back, because we've gotten people who have been waiting for three weeks calling our office. But you're going to get a call back from my office from an unidentified number, because we're not working from the state house. And actually, if we were working from the state house, it would still be an unidentified number. So it's, it's frustrating, but people have to do that. Um, there was a couple of other things that I wanted to mention. One is that uh, you can now apply in Spanish, and the department is working to get other languages up. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with how well they're doing, given the uh, flood of applications. Uh, but I think a lot of people are frustrated because people who were not eligible for unemployment before, people who were, who were gig workers or self-employed, those people will have to wait till April 30th although they're trying to get it up faster. There's no, they have to set up a completely new system uh, with a new vendor, uh, correlate those accounts with Department of Revenue. And there's half a million people in that group that, not that they'll all be unemployed, but most of them will be unemployed. So it's a new, new flood of applications, a new system they're setting up. So it's frustrating, um, but we're hopeful. And Pat, the way I understand it is the unemployment, the, the, they start off at a base of you get 50% of your, your salary or your take home. So- And you're getting it, another 600 from this, a week from the federal government. So it's a, it's a pretty progressive um, solution because people who were not making a lot of money uh, will be uh, getting proportionally a bigger boost and it'll make a bigger difference for them. So I'm, I think it's a good, it's a good solution. Um, so it doesn't it, fall all on the state for the unemployment. They're getting a oh, the whole the, the federal government is picking up on that. So let me ask you about um, reserves for uh, just for a minute. Um, the unemployment, the unemployment that would be coming in to people's bank accounts or in the case of where they don't have a bank account, they're gonna to have to wait much longer for a paper check. Do I have yes. that right? And there is a, you, you don't have to do that. You can now online, I believe as of today, um, if you don't have a bank account, 
uh, there's an uh, an address you can go to and ch and add your bank account online. Let me see if I have that right now. It's called Get My Money, some or something like that. Um, and if you uh, call, let me see if I can remember that. I can't remember that. That's all right, but it's within the state unemployment uh, website. Yes. Yes. I think so. Uh, no, I think that might be federal. No, it's IRS. It's the IRS site. It, it's, uh, if you go to the IRS, look for coronavirus economic impact payments. Uh, they'll give you the, they can, you can sign up for uh, getting your uh, account online, I mean, in your bank. And obviously people would rather do that because they do not want to go to the mailbox, pick up a check and go to the bank. So you had mentioned it before about, um, you know, the unemployment, they're trying to get a hold of people by making phone calls. Well, and they're not reaching out, they're trying to reach back. People have called in. So then another thing that happens is people have questions. Uh, they, have, they get stuck. Uh, so it's been helpful. Uh, I have a constituent services director, Rachel Clinton, who is calling people back. They have to leave a message on our uh, phone, which is 617-722-1578. And Rachel calls them back and is sometimes able to reach someone to strip. There's a lot of really confusing questions um, that people are trying to straighten out. And then there are a lot of questions people have about the federal benefits, the um, pay, Paycheck Protection Plan, uh, or other uh, federal programs, and we have to refer those people to our uh, federal legislators. Um, but there's a lot that's gone up really fast. There are some holes that people didn't anticipate. Um, we were asked yesterday, oh, uh, religious institutions, how their, their people are not eligible for unemployment. They haven't been in the uh, uh, churches and religious institutions have not been in the state unemployment program, but they will be in the federal one. So that's good. Got it. So when it comes to where people can find resources, because this is a confusing time for a lot of people, um, the city of Somerville set up they have beefed up their 311 system. Across your district, um, do you know, and maybe Rep Conley can chime in, has Cambridge got a similar system for constituents to call in to help them navigate all of this stuff? Medford, Cambridge, Somerville, Winchester? I know Cambridge's website and their communications have been really excellent, so um, they are, proactively communicating out to people. And I believe they're planning a citywide mailing to get this sort of basic essential info out to folks as well. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I'm just, I'm trying to point everyone into the direction of, you know, local, local as well as um, your offices and the federal hotlines that they have. So- That's good. I think each of the cities and towns has, is, trying really hard to keep adding things, but there are so many, I mean, what's exciting to me is so many people are stepping up, offering new services that you didn't know about. I think we talked last week about the, the mama's group. The we did. Yeah. And for example, in my neighborhood, and I think many neighborhoods, the little leader, little leader I, the leader of it went around and left a note on everybody's doorstep, not counting on other means of communication. Uh, to tell people uh, we haven't nobody's asked for help yet but uh, there's a little bit of yes there has been a little bit of communication there and I don't know obviously everything that's happening but there's that there's there's restaurants who have changed their uh, there's one in your neighborhood Joe where you can order um, boxes of fruit and vegetables people are being very creative um, people in on Prospect Hill in our neighborhood are are making masks for uh, Cambridge Health Alliance. I know people are delivering um, food for Little Sisters of the Poor. There's so many um, people stepping up and trying to help. It's wonderful. And the city, uh, I think the city just launched the city of Somerville anyway. Just launched their partnership with United Way of Mass Bay, and they're asking, you know, if you're not sure how to help and you're not sure um, whether or not 
your money is going to go to a certain cause, you can always donate through the uh, United Way website. Uh, just mark, make sure you mark it that it's City of Somerville responds uh, COVID-19 and the funds will get to the appropriate place. But that's going to be a big ask for a lot of people because a lot of people don't have those funds, those discretionary funds these days. Pat, how long, are you getting a sense of how long it's actually taking someone from the time that they file for the unemployment monies till when they actually receive it in their bank account? Well, let me explain that people who get good service and immediate satisfaction don't call our office, so I can't. I'm guessing that's because we haven't had thousands of phone calls that uh, many people are, are getting their checks, not their checks, but their deposits. Okay. Does the state report that out in any way, shape, or form that they have accepted X number of applications, they've processed the applications, and that that person is now receiving a check? Yeah, there's probably close to 400,000 people. Um, uh, who are now receiving checks, and that's up from mm, around 100,000 before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pat, anything else on the well, unemployment just one other side? Thing I would like to tell you, because I, um, it's new, and I found people interested in it. There's two um, portals available for people to apply for jobs. One set of jobs is contact tracing. Uh, we need to find out... Uh, who has been in contact with people who have corona and that those jobs are available at, but for and more people are interested in that or more people are qualified but extremely important is one to that where people can apply for jobs in nursing facilities they are have a 40% vacancy rate in nursing facilities and an unbelievably challenging job so i hope people who have have any of those skills will apply for those jobs. Let's talk about the contract tracing for one second. That is, there's no physical contact that people are doing. No, this is all done by phone. Exactly. And particularly they will need people with uh, language skills. Got it. That's great news. Great news. Rep Conley, let's go into the housing side of things. We're going to have an awful lot of people who are housing insecure in the coming months. Do you want to kind of take it from the state house update that you gave a little while ago? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. And yeah, it's great to be here with Senator Jalen. Um, thanks for having us again. And the big news is last night, um, the House and Senate conferees, the negotiators who were ironing out the final language on our eviction and foreclosure moratorium bill, uh, reached an agreement um, on final language and I'm truly uh, gratified and, and very happy with the result. Um, there's a legal services attorney from Greater Boston Legal Services who has been working closely with me and with other advocates to push for this bill. Uh, and when he reviewed the legislation, he said this is a total home run. Um, and so the language that um, has now been agreed to by House and Senate leaders um, would create an, a, a moratorium on the eviction process. And that's every step of the eviction process, you know, starting with a notice to quit or an attempt by a landlord to terminate a tenancy, uh, continuing with a freeze on any filings, uh, either in housing court or district court, um, as well as a freeze on any sort of judgments. And that could be, um, a negotiated judgment or a default judgment, um, and then continuing to put a halt on uh, what they call levies on execution, which is really the final step where a sheriff or a constable would attempt to eject someone um, from a dwelling. So Mike, really Mike I'm, process, I'm sorry for one second. What's the start date of that? Um, this has been drafted as an emergency bill, so it would take effect uh, immediately upon the governor signing it. And the Senate has a session later today. So assuming um, if, if we're fortunate enough to get it through the Senate, it would then go to the governor's desk. So, so it, it would take... Agreed. It's agreed, so... It's agreed, and it would take effect immediately. Let me ask a question about some of those poor folks who have been 
they've already had eviction notices served to them. Um, does it cover them at all? It, it, it would in general, because, you know, as we just outlined, there are many steps in the process. And so one of the things that was really a focus of ours over these past few weeks was ensuring that, you know, if someone's anywhere in that process, that this moratorium would apply to them. So um, if you're still in your home as of right now, you should be able to stay um, as we continue through this very difficult situation. Um, and certainly, you know, anyone listening who's concerned about their housing stability um, should reach out to my office, uh, reach out to the Senator's office. You know, we can connect folks with the legal services attorneys or with people like um, Alan Schechter at the Office of Housing Stability in Somerville. And absolutely, um, the legislation that we're moving forward should create a lot more protections uh, for people um, who are feeling these concerns right now. And we know it, it's many people. And I think I asked you, Mike, at the town hall that we conducted on Saturday, how long would that take effect? Um, so that's one of the final details. The way this is going to work is it's going to be uh, for several months um, from the date it's signed. And then um, it'll reach a point where it will expire, but the governor will be empowered to continue it. And it could potentially run um, for the full duration of the state of the emergency and an additional 45 days. So um, certainly for the next few months, at the very least, it will be in place. And then um, it looks like we will have to revisit it um, from there. Okay. Sorry, go, go ahead, Mike. It's just... You know, people people love to hear the good news, but they're not oh, yeah. quite sure when it's going to take effect, whether or not it will cover them, and how long this thing is going to go on. So, sorry, go oh, ahead. That's an Mike. excellent question. Yeah, and so it, it would potentially take effect as soon as this afternoon. We'll we'll see. You know how the governor uh, receives it. He certainly indicated that he's deferring to the legislature, at least in some of his initial comments. So hopeful that it will pass and. There's so much more to the bill. So really what I just outlined um, are some of the protections for tenants. There are additional protections for tenants and then there are protections um, for homeowners and for landlords and for small business um, entities. So um, to continue with some of the tenant protections, um, any tenant who has been impacted and that could be you know, directly or even indirectly a tenant who's impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic um, can um, notify their landlord that that's what they're going through. And then upon that notification, a landlord would be prohibited from charging any late fees or from sending any negative reporting to any kind of credit agency. So um, another additional protection, and, and there will be a form that the state's Department of Housing and Community Development will be producing to standardize that process so a tenant can fill out that form and hand it to their landlord. I actually thought the presence of the form will be helpful because you know you can imagine that's a difficult conversation. So to kind of have a document um, to walk you through that, I think will be a good step. And in addition, it's a moratorium on foreclosure activity similar to the eviction moratorium it really covers you know all of the different steps that are involved um, in a foreclosure action uh, it also is a moratorium on evictions of small businesses um, which is something you know i've discussed with union square main streets folks and other folks who uh, are you know terribly concerned about what we're facing um, not just with the pandemic itself but the economic impacts um, in addition, there's some additional provisions. There's a forbearance program uh, for folks with mortgages. And so if um, someone is unable to make their mortgage payment, they will be, you know, um, they're, the person who has lent them the money for their home will be required to provide them with a forbearance. And the way that will work is, um, you know, if you're not able to make, say, four payments, then those four payments just get tacked on to the end of the mortgage, however many years out that may be, and then you just make four additional monthly payments at the very end. 
So that seems like a very, um, you know, helpful option for people who are struggling uh, to make those mortgage payments right now. And um, a new detail that got worked into the bill, and, and I think it, it definitely will offer something uh, to landlords who are concerned, um, you know, about their own obligations. The bill will allow landlords to use um, funds that they have segregated for last month's rent. And they, they, they can only use those funds not to necessarily cover an inability of a tenant to pay rent, that's not allowed, but they can use the funds to pay things like taxes, uh, to pay their own mortgage, or to pay for things like repairs or upkeep. And I really thought this was um, a brilliant provision that will really ensure that um, there's something that you know can help particularly those small landlords who have an obligation and, and need some assistance with that. What we're talking, Mike, what we're talking about are the escrow accounts that are usually set up when somebody right. enters into a lease for a residential apartment. Give me right. first month's, last month's rent. The, the owner of that property is not allowed to use that escrow for anything other than a security or a last month's rent. What they're now allowed to do is to use that to actually keep the property going. Is Correct. that what, yeah, okay. That's what it does. And, it, and, and in this case, the, how the final language um, was drafted, it's just the last month's rent, so we're not actually touching the security deposit. And for tenants, um, they will be held harmless in this whole deal. So there won't be any obligation, you know, they've already paid their last month's rent. Right. So there's right. no obligation on the tenant to resupply the last month's rent. It's just that they've already put that payment in and it's sitting there. And now if a landlord can document that they have an obligation that they need help meeting, they can access that last month's rent ahead of time. Um, and another benefit for tenants is that um, that last month's rent collects interest and that interest will continue to be owed to the tenant. So they won't, the tenant won't even lose the benefit of their interest. It's all um, it's all great news, Mike, and and so you anticipate that this is going to be signed by the governor because it it sounds like it is a good, comprehensive, um, very well thought out. So what I want to do though, there's a couple of more issues. Is the all, all of these things going to be posted on your website, Senator Jalen's website, I assume, and then the cities will also have opportunity to post these on the informational sites. I would think so. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I have a website. It's called repmikeconnolly.org. Um, and I've already posted um, what I just outlined here and, and we'll continue to update that. And I know Senator Jalen has one of the best email lists around. So thank you for that, Senator. Um, and I'm sure the city of Somerville, who, you know, and, and let's just be uh, let's give credit where credit is due. The city of Somerville has really been the leader in calling for these kinds of protections. So, you know, I'm really proud of the work that the mayor and the city council have done to sort of set the table and set the direction. And, it, and we're really building on concepts that Somerville supports um, up on Beacon Hill. Great news. Senator Jalen, I wanna switch back over to you for a minute. We, we had touched at the town hall meeting. Representative Conley was talking about the situation in the jails, but this morning, uh, there was some really sad news that came out of another part of the country where a uh, nursing home operator um, was not reporting COVID-related deaths. Um, so bringing it back to our district here, we have multiple um, uh, types of facilities where our seniors are housed. Do you want to start talking about the nursing homes, the, the assisted livings, uh, the senior housing situation as it stands today? Yeah, that is a real concern in both, in, in nursing homes, the death rate is at least four times what it is in the rest of the population. I uh, spent Monday calling all the nursing homes in my district and started on the assisted livings. Um, two of the uh, administrators broke down in tears while they were talking to me. Um, in one uh, nursing home they had had the, the, in Cambridge because the Cambridge uh, nursing facilities had uh, universal testing um, 
they had a third of their patients test positive and half of their workers. And uh, they, were, they had lost at that point, I think four people and, and expected to lose of the patients. Um, it's some, some facilities are doing okay. Um, some have, uh, one facility said they'd had one person test positive and go out. Um, and that actually, that was Little Sisters, um, and that person was sent to the hospital. Uh, what, they're being very creative, and it's just heartbreaking to hear how it is that um, because uh, families can't visit, that one nursing facility brought in hospice for some of their patients and you can visit when your family's in hospice but also it gave them two more workers mm -hmm. uh, nursing homes are way down and they were already across the state short work uh, 17 percent of their workers uh, they were, the pay is not enough to keep people working in these facilities and now it's not just the pay but people are risking their lives to go in infection rates among the, without enough um, protection equipment, infection rates among the workers are very high, and then those that are left are afraid to come to work. So another uh, administrator started paying people 50% retention, 50% uh, additional pay if they would stay and didn't find anyone who would take it. On the other hand, the pay is so little that one of the workers said, I don't want to be tested. I don't want to be tested because I can't afford to leave my job. Mm. It's, this is a serious uh, focus for us. Uh, right, across, right across the board though, Senator Jalen, we, um, we have many of those, we have at least three of the major ones here in the city of Somerville. I know that Medford has a few more of the assisted living. Cambridge has, has a lot of the, um, aftercare types of, you know, like Neville House and, and those places. Are we sensing that all of those, all of those institutions that house our vulnerable aging population, are they ready and, or have they experienced, I know you're talking about the staff side of it, but have they experienced any hot spots at this point that we know of? I think there is one nursing home where they expect half of them half of the patients to be uh, infected um, and there's others where they're not and it really depends on if someone comes in in one case it was a worker because the workers are paid so little they work multiple jobs and so one worker working in a off in a different site brought it in right in another case a work a, a patient came back from the hospital infected and it spread throughout the facility so it's, we're going we're gonna to need a lot more conversation going forward. So I, I'm just going to put the offer back out on the table between the state delegation, the city councils. I know that Cambridge is doing their own thing. We're trying to get the information out to Medford. So your sites, again, we'll, we'll try to keep pumping those on the uh, Somerville Media Center. But let me, just, let me just say that, you know, looking at the numbers once again this morning, it's smack dab in your face that we are in the middle of this thing. And it's not going to get better for another couple of weeks before we see those numbers start falling. But for everything that you're doing from the Somerville Media Center to you, thank you so much. Come back again next week or come back real soon. State Senator Pat Jalen, State Representative Mike Connolly, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And just thank you, Joe, and the Somerville Media Center and Adam Stone, because I think communication is one of the things people are, are most in need of, and we are very grateful to you. Thank you so much. See you next time.